During the week, like yourselves, I have to shop in the supermarkets and uh, buy the groceries. And I was really struck by the choices people have. I didn't buy any ice cream, but I was looking at this wall of ice cream. There were hundreds of choices, different sizes, different makes, different ingredients, different coatings. Oh, there must have been a couple hundred choices of ice cream, and we're used to choices. That's part of America, that's part of our consumerist culture. But in the Word of God, all of the choices we make, all of the moral decisions we make, resolve themselves into only two choices between foolishness and wisdom. That's why the first reading the church provides here from the book of Proverbs says, wisdom has built her house. Forsake foolishness that you might live. And in Paul's reading from Ephesians, brothers and sisters, watch carefully how you live, not as foolish persons, but as wise. Try to understand what is the will of the Lord for you. In the scriptures, we find these two choices given different names, but essentially the same. Not only a choice between living lives with wisdom and living lives that are foolish, but also living in the light or in the darkness, being members of the kingdom, or of the world, living a life whose foundation is built upon solid rock or shifting sands, walking the narrow way that leads to life or the broad way that leads to destruction. So that's, that's, the scriptures are constantly telling us, look, your ethical choices fall into one of those two categories. There are no other categories. And why is it that so many people today walk the wrong path? St. Paul says that when the evil one proposes a bad choice to us, he doesn't present it as something bad. He doesn't say, look, this is evil and terrible, do it, no. St. Paul says the evil one acts as an angel of light, meaning the evil one presents to us choices that seem more liberating, more modern, more enlightened, more pleasurable, that sort of expand our life, even as it slowly destroys us. Now, part of the wisdom that the scriptures propose to us is in the beautiful chapter six of John's gospel. It's all about the Eucharist. Now, when Jesus talked about the Eucharist, he uses very, very clear language. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life within you. It was a horrible thought to the Jewish people. They were forbidden to have anything to do with blood because blood was the gift of life that belonged to the realm of God. Make sure you do not eat of the blood for blood is life. You shall not eat that life with the flesh. Do not let your children eat it that they might prosper for doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter. And there are other scriptures too, forbidding them to eat blood. So when Jesus says, unless you drink the blood, well, they didn't understand. They were scandalized. That's when Jesus lost most of his followers during his earthly life. They refused to walk with him anymore. He didn't make any sense. And we can't blame the Jews for not understanding because neither did the apostles. They didn't understand until after the resurrection <coughs> of Jesus Christ. Understand what? 
that first of all, when they encountered the, the Last Supper, Jesus broke the bread, said, this is my body. It was a prediction, a prediction of his violent being torn apart in his passion. But then, after his resurrection, they experienced his presence. He actually ate meals with them. And then at Emmaus, he broke the bread, said the blessing, and all of a sudden they realized it was Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread, and then he disappeared. So that blew their minds. So it was a prediction, then the experience of presence, and then after the resurrection, they focused on the promise that this is the bread from heaven and those who consume it are going to have a life which is eternal. And so we believe as Catholics in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. That is why when we enter church, we don't just enter it like this is a movie theater. We either bow or we genuflect. And that's important. Don't shortchange yourself by being unaware of the mystery in which you are about to partake. Because it is a mystery. You know when we do things, oftentimes, the routine can make things just seem unexciting. But we are entering into the mystery of Christ's living presence within us. And we need to acknowledge that even the way, by the way we enter church and by the way we leave it. This is what St. Augustine said. Until now, as you see, it is simply bread and wine. But once the consecration takes place, this bread will be the body of Christ, and this wine will be the blood of Christ. St. Augustine said that in the fourth century. It's a consistent belief of the Catholic Church in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, said this, this food which you receive, this bread which comes down from heaven, holds the substance of eternal life. So, somehow, when we come up to receive the Eucharist, we should use that opportunity for intimate conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ who cares about us, who wants what is good for us, who strengthens us to make good decisions and who walks with us through whatever dark valleys our life might involve. Now, I'll just mention something that I mentioned last week but at a different mass. Mother Teresa found her strength in that intimate connection with Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Even though she was busy, she spent every day, the beginning of every day, with an hour before the Blessed Sacrament, an intimate conversation with Jesus Christ, sometimes without words, just experiencing his love and his presence. And she knew this was the spiritual basis for her life. This was why her ministry was so fruitful. But the other nuns came up to her and said this, Mother Teresa, we know you spend an hour before the Blessed Sacrament every day, but there are people who want to see you. The ministry is growing. There's more and more sisters, more decisions to make. Could you just limit yourself to half an hour before the Blessed Sacrament? And that you'd find that half hour filled up with, with lots of work that you have to do. You know what she did? She increased her time before the Blessed Sacrament to two hours because she had this powerful living faith in the presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. So, as we come up this morning, what do we want to do? 
It's a beginning of an encounter with a resurrected Jesus Christ. And we want to go back to our pews. We want that intimate connection with the Lord by our own personal prayer, by talking with the Lord, by experiencing his presence, by receiving the grace and help and strength he wants to give us for living a good life. So when we say amen to the body of Christ, that's the beginning of an intimate union, the center of our faith, a gift from the Lord himself to the people about whom he cares so very much. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, 